Um, I'm excited to talk to you about one of our major projects in the lab, uh, which I titled Dissecting Chromatin Remodel or Modified Oligonucleosome Patterns in Vitro and in Vivo with Single Molecule Sequencing. And I wanted to start by showing this beads on a string cartoon of nucleosomes positioned along DNA. And as you likely know, nucleosome positioning and occupancy are extremely important as they either provide or block accessibility to different gene regulatory factors. For instance, heterochromatin typically consists of compact nucleosomes and uh, fixed nucleosome repeat lengths. And these patterns create what is generally a transcriptionally inactive uh, genome subcompartment whereas euchromatin consists of lower nucleosome density with irregular NRLs, and these nucleosome-free regions, or NFRs, promote transcription factor binding, rendering what is also generally a transcriptionally active genome subcompartment. So how exactly are nucleosomes positioned in such a customized manner? We know that there are many epigenomic regulators that drive gene expression, such as DNA methylation or histone post-translational modifications. But today I'll be focusing on um, ATP dependent chromatin remodelers. And this large family of multi subunit proteins all harness the power of ATP through a functional ATPase in order to modulate nucleosome positioning in some way. And they also carry out specific biological functions through additive protein subunits. So, for example, members of the imitation switch or I switch family remodelers through its ATP SNP2H are known to slide nucleosomes and create regularly spaced arrays or fixed nucleosome repeat lengths. And it's often associated with um, heterochromatin formation. Other examples broadly include the switch SNF family, which may evict nucleosomes to create site accessibility, or the NO80 family, which has many roles, including uh, loading of nucleosomes onto DNA. So ATP dependent chromatin remodelers have many roles, um, including but not cer certainly not limited to these that I mentioned, but all of these roles modulate nucleosome positioning in some way to ultimately dictate um, underlying DNA accessibility. So how do we study these unique nucleosome patterns? Uh, we can do this via nuclease digestion of isolated chromatin paired with high throughput sequencing, where the nuclease cleaves accessible DNA, leaving a footprint of the nucleosomes. Through techniques like MNA-seq, we have a really good understanding of how nucleosomes are positioned genome-wide. And this map shows the landscape of nucleosomes of many averaged uh, genes surrounding their transcription start sites. So the NFR prior to the TSS is flanked by two well-positioned nucleosomes, turn the minus one and plus one nucleosome. And those surrounding nucleosomes are well-phased while downstream you get start to get fuzzy or unfazed nucleosomes. So nucleosomes are therefore positioned in non-randomly across genome um, regions to allow proper spatiotemporal access to gene regulatory elements such as transcription factors. So while deep sequencing of nuclei's digested chromatin has given us a great sense of genome-wide nucleosome patterns, there are several existing drawbacks. The main one being that the chromatin is often digested down to these mononucleosome sizes prior to sequencing. So you don't get a sense of longer range chromatin fiber patterns. And these techniques also rely on short read sequencing, which can only map 600 to 700 base pairs of DNA. And both of these limitations ultimately prevent mapping to repetitive or other hard to sequence regions. Another me method for mapping nucleosomes is through footprinting with either a CPG or GPC DNA methyl transferase. And this method, typically known as GNOME-seq or MAPIT, methylates available cytosines in linker DNA with a GPC or within a GPC or a CPG dinucleotide context to capture up to about four nucleosomes. So in addition to also relying on short read sequencing, this method requires bisulfite conversion to distinguish your methylated cytosines. Bisulfite conversion is a very harsh method that destroys chromatin fibers, shortening your reads further. And lastly, there's also existing CPG bias um, as they are unevenly distributed within the genome, as well as endogenous methylation, making it difficult for the technique to resolve source of uh, methylation. Another drawback associated with uh, these methods are bulk average sequences. The current methods to map nucleosomes take bulk average me measurements of the fragment reads. So you do not get a sequence specific resolution of your mapped nucleosomes. For, for, 
instance, a particular locus might be frequent subject to sliding or eviction of nucleosomes, but your bulk average nucleosome occupancy and regularity measurements won't be able to capture that discrete pattern. And this would be very compelling information to have, especially in the context of ATP dependent chromatin remodelers. In our project, we aim to determine if we can overcome these limitations using single molecule sequencing of fiber structures. So to overcome these limitations I mentioned, we developed a single molecule sequencing method utilizing PacBio single molecule real-time sequencing. And this is a sequencing platform that can capture long reads up to 10 to 20 kb. For our initial studies, we assembled histones onto a DNA sequence um, containing the nucleosome favorable, favorable um, Woodham 601 sequence with salt gradient dialysis, and then methylated the available linker sequence with a nonspecific adenine methyl transferase, which is less biased than a um, CPG methyl transferase to leave a nucleosome footprint, and then prepared double stranded libraries for long read sequencing. So this footprinted DNA is then ligated with a barcoded hairpin adapter called a smart bell, which is which allows for the highly processive polymerase to read around several times and obtain a highly accurate consensus sequence. Um, I don't have time to go over this in a lot of detail, but the PAC biosequencer can inherently detect this M6A modification. So as the sequencing polymerase encounters epigenetic modification, it temporarily stalls, and then the time to incorporate the base is longer compared to its unmodified version. And this can be measured as time for a specific mod modification like M6A. So we've since published, published a proof of concept on the assay, which we've called SAMOSA, or single molecule adenine methylated oligonucleosome sequencing assay. And I'll next briefly go over the analysis pipeline, which is mainly developed by our postdoc, computational postdoc in the lab, Colin. And the goal of this pipeline is to convert raw pulse measurements that I mentioned before into usable nucleosome footprinting data. So as shown here, the scatter plot shows the transform signal of the adenine base incorporation times for a thousand base pair portion of the sample molecule where um, the accessible methylated adenines have um, longer pulses as expected. And we next use a, um, a neural network regression model to predict the expected pulse time for each adenine based on its context and then subtract this expectation from the observed measurement. And this allows us to obtain confident predictions of pulse times and evidence of methylation for anything above zero. Uh, we next wanted to generate more clear cut binary methylation predictions. And we did this by applying a filter cutoff to these IPD predictions generated before. Um, and then finally, we applied this to a machine learning model called a hidden Markov model to predict more continuous regions of the DNA molecule that were either um, accessible or inaccessible. And we can use the, um, this pipeline for all uh, downstream analyses. So this heat map shows methylation prediction of 500 individual sequence molecules. And these molecules were derived from a methylated template assembled with histones onto nine repeating Widom 601 sequences that I mentioned before. And in the heat map, every line is a molecule, and then the dark purple is adenine methylation, whereas the light blue is no methylation. And shown here, the predicted methylation is only seen in the accessible linker DNA regions along the molecule, while inaccessible regions containing assembled nucleosomes were unmethylated. So with our technique, we show that we can use this adenine methyl transferase to um, methylate linker DNA specifically, and that we can map the uh, single molecule nucleosome footprints at high resolution. So after this proof of concept, one of our next questions was to determine if we can detect nucleosome footprints on native mammalian chromatin templates where we don't know the sequence preference of the nucleosomes. To test this, we amplified two target sequences from the mass genome, followed by cloning, prep, and then purification of the target DNA. We again um, assembled histones with salt gradient dialysis, but this time varied the ratio of histones to DNA to obtain templates of varying density, as has been done um, by several previous studies. Uh, we then performed the adenine methylation footprinting assay and then subjected these libraries to PacBio single molecule sequencing. 
So we use the generated methylation and accessibility predictions that I mentioned before to uh, detect the range of footprint distributions of um, each set of assembled chromatin shown in this graph from lower to higher densities. For all densities, we see peaks of unmethylated DNA corresponding to the nucleosomes ranging from about 120 to 140 base pairs wide with a second beast, a peak detected at um, dinucleosome stretches. And we see that as the chromatin becomes denser, the fraction of larger uh, footprint sizes also increases. Uh, we use this data to also estimate the nucleosome density. And these histograms just show the nucleosomes per template in the sequence molecules, which match pretty closely to our targeted densities from five to one to 20 to one. So now that we've shown that we can specifically footprint nucleosomes on a native template, we wanted to see how these footprints change in the presence of a remodeler. So first we created these horizon plots to visualize in bulk where nucleosomes are favored along the sequence, showing footprint length in base pairs versus the footprint midpoint with higher nucleosome uh, footprint counts shown in orange. And the first plot just shows the native unremodeled 10 to one density chromatin and as you can see around 150 here, you get mononucleosome size footprints as well as some larger dye and trinucleosome footprints showing uh, that there's nucleosome sequence preference along the molecule. We then subjected, uh, we then subjected the native chromatin to endpoint remodeling reactions with SNF2H, the iSwitch ATPase motor that I mentioned before. And we did this in collaboration with the Nerlikar lab here at UCSF where they have extensively studied SNF2H and its uh, nucleosome sliding mechanism. So as you can see here, after SNF2H remodeling, it only shows these uh, more mononucleosome size footprints along all positions of the sequence, suggesting that the remodeler is shifting nucleosomes and uh, ultimately overriding any sequence dependent nucleosome preference. So SNF2H remodeling also doesn't seem to ch doesn't change the amount of nucleosomes occupied on the template, which is consistent with what we know about SNF2H sliding and equalizing uh, flanking DNA mechanisms, and not evicting nucleosomes like other remodeler complexes. We next wanted to do some analyses to get a better understanding of how SNF2H remodels across uh, stretches of nucleosomes. And this is a unique analysis that we could do using the single molecule data, um, specifically at trinucleosome stretches. And to do this, we calculated the difference in the midpoint distances of three consecutive nucleosomes, both before and after remodeling, and then um, correlated these distances. So I'll next show some scatter plots that look like this one that show how well distance two and distance one are correlated as a measure of distance with uh, like green and yellow in the bottom left corner indicating higher correlation of the um, calculated difference. So here are the correlation plots of all chromatin densities from low to high in their unremodeled state. And you have increasing co correlation and distribution with higher densities. But then when you remodel with SNF2H, we see that remodeling changes the relationship of the distances across all of densities by decreasing the correlation to some extent. And these patterns show sort of smoothing effect that indicates very heterogeneous remodeling outcomes in the differing assemblies. And we're doing uh, further analyses on these templates to better understand um, how this works. I don't have uh, time to go over this in a lot of detail, but I wanted to switch gears and talk about our in vivo adaptation of the assay, which we also previously published on um, from K562 cells. And briefly, this is done by isolating nuclei from live mammalian cells and then directly methylating the nuclei with the ECOG2 adenine methyltransferase I, I mentioned before to capture those footprints and then performing a very light micrococal nuclease or MNAs digest to liberate these um, methylated and then long uh, oligonucleosome fragments and then preparing those fragments for single molecule sequencing as we did before. We were also interested to see how SNF2H influence um, genome-wide nucleosome patterns on single molecule fibers, and then applied the in vivo SMOS adaptation to mouse embryonic uh, stem cells expressing no SNF2H protein, and then um, MESCs expressing wild-type uh, SNF2H 
And these uh, lines were kindly provided by uh, the Dirk Schubler lab and they previously did some interesting global chromatin studies. Um, these cell lines specifically demonstrating how SNP2H might distinctly remodel um, with other transcription factors to influence um, global nucleosome patterns and um, accessibility to those transcription factors. So with the um, SMOSA data derived from the knockout and wild type re-expression cell lines, we performed analyses similar to our in vitro data. We first calculated the average single molecule methylation patterns across a thousand base pair stretch following an MNase cut, which allows us to detect nucleosome regularity. And as you can see in the SNP2H knockout in blue, this leads to longer NRLs, while re-expression of the wild type SNP2H decreases the NRL on individual fibers. And this mainly corroborates previous bulk studies where loss of SNF2H, SNF2H decreased nucleosome phasing and increased linker lengths. So now that we have provided further in vivo evidence of SNF2H and its role as a nucleosome spacer, for my final slide, I wanted to show you how we can further stratify this. And we performed a genome-wide analysis on the wild type um, SNF2H MESCs. Um, this was an analysis called unsupervised latent clustering. And this allowed us to detect six distinct clusters or fiber types to better understand genomic usage of, um, the, um, of the fiber types. And two of these are irregular clusters at high or low density with poor phasing, followed by four regular clusters with good phasing from longer to shorter um, NRLs. And we next wanted to see if the usage of these fiber types changes in the SNP2H knockout context. And as you can see here pretty clearly in the knockout setting on the left, there's an enrichment for irregular and long NRLs and then depletion for regular NRLs. While in the SNP2H re-expression line, you get depletion of long NRLs and irregular types um, and enrichment of shorter, um, uh, sh shorter irregular NRLs fibers. And overall, uh, I would say that studying these single molecule fibers has allowed us to speculate further about SNP2H and its role in vivo. And we're currently doing more analyses to determine how SNP2H um, acts in these, in these different um, contexts. So in summary, um, our assay allows us to use uh, study single molecule nucleosome patterns, both in vitro and in vivo. And we can examine the consequences of SNP2H remodeling um, using this assay. And um, importantly, it allows us to detect these more discrete nucleosome patterns, both in vitro and in vivo on mammalian chromatin. And so far, our findings suggest very heterogeneous um, SNP2H or I-switch remodeling outcomes. And we're looking forward to um, studying these patterns further. And um, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who helped both experimentally and computationally. It's been a very collaborative effort. Both Vijay and Colin have spearheaded the computational analyses as well as input from Mike Lee and Siba, and especially Laura, a postdoc in the Nerlikar lab, who was very instrumental in the chromatin assembly and remodeling for um, all of these experiments. <laughs>